Turbulence and zonal jets. Right, so here's a, a picture of a long simulation with a numerical model of the ocean zonal flow at 400 meters depth. And if you look at the ocean circulation, what you'll see depends on the time scales you look at. If you look at an instantaneous snapshot of the flow, you'll see a sea of eddies. You'll just see little round blobs everywhere. If you look over a very, very long time average, you'll see the gyres. You'll see the anticyclonic gyres, the Gulf Stream, the Kuroshio. If you look at, on timescales of a few months, what you tend to see is these zonally orientated streaks which alternate in sign. So there's an eastward jet, a westward jet, an eastward jet, a westward jet. And they are separated by a typical length uh, scale in, in the meridional direction. And so that's an ocean model here. It's a little bit more noisy, but you can see the same thing using altimetric satellite observations. So here is the sea surface height. From that, you can deduce the geostrophic surface flow. And you can sort of see these zonal jets in that. And there's the vorticity, the geostrophic vorticity. Right. So there is some theory that goes with that. And uh, let me take you back to the Rossby radius. OK, you remember the Rossby radius? It is the length scale on which you have a sort of balance between the relative vorticity term and the vortex stretching term. So it is the root GH over F. It's the wave speed divided by the Coriolis parameter. Well, let's think of another length scale now. Uh, and we'll use the vorticity equation for this length scale. And so here's the vorticity equation. D by dt of relative vorticity is the advection of relative vorticity and the advection of planetary vorticity. So what if those two terms are of similar magnitude? Well, you can do a scale analysis of that. And what you get is that length scale on which that is true is the square root of u over beta, where u is the flow speed. Uh, that, that's very similar to what we did with the equatorial radius, if you remember, um, where we had an equatorial length scale, which was the square root of the wave speed, the gravity wave speed divided by beta. This time, it's the square root of the actual flow speed divided by beta. And that is called the Rhine's length. Now, you can think about what happens in the transition between Rossby waves and closed geostrophic eddies, which are turbulent. And so you can look at the frequencies associated with those two things. So here's the frequency associated with Rossby waves. There's the, the dispersion relation for Rossby waves. And you can equate that to a frequency associated with turbulence, which is the length scale of that turbulence, or the, the equivalent wave number, multiplied by a typical turbulent flow velocity scale. So if you equate those two things, you'll, you'll see the point at which the two are of the same order, uh, the, on the same, the same time scale. Remember, k squared is l squared plus m squared, and l is the zonal wave number. So you get this equation here. k squared is beta over u star times cos theta, where theta is the angle between l and m. Right? And um, then you can plot that, and you get this nice anisotropic type of dumbbell plot, where this blue curve is the boundary between where the turbulence takes over and where you have Rossby waves. So the larger scales here, inside the blue uh, dumbbell, you have Rossby waves, and outside you have geostrophic turbulence. And as I said, it's, it's not isotropic. And what's particularly interesting is these, these points here, positive and negative here, where you have a typical meridional length scale. And so does that length scale, that meridional length scale, emerge? And yes, yes, of course it does. And it is this. It's the Rhine's scale. And here's an experiment where a turbulent model has been initialized with just one single length scale. So the initial condition is some sort of grid lattice where there's only one length scale. It's the size of the grid. And so if you plot that in kx, ky, oh, so, so uh, l and m space, you just get a circle. So everything's got the same wave number, the same length scale. And then you let it develop. And gradually, it'll develop into turbulence. And so there will be scale interactions, because it's nonlinear. So it will spread in scale. So you'll see this circle 
in wave number space will start to spread out to other length scales. And then as it continues to develop, you'll see it'll spread into this shape where you have turbulence everywhere except for this dumbbell shape in which you have Rossby wave regimes. And the, most of the energy will congregate into these points where you have a certain radional length scale. Okay? And that is the distance between these zonal jets which emerge in this idealized experiment. So that's a kind of neat theoretical demonstration of the existence of these zonal jets in the ocean. So this is where we get to the end of the course, really. And I, I'm thinking a lot of the stuff we've done has been idealized theories that we've tried to apply to real world situations in the atmosphere and the ocean. And here's an example where we apply it to the ocean. But the atmosphere and the ocean don't always cooperate with our theories because they're more complicated. And there are some things which, which can make it difficult to apply the theory. Things like, for example, in the ocean, you have these coastlines, right, which is quite annoying because it would be much simpler if the ocean just went all the way around the world because the coastline makes the theory much more difficult. Right? Or scale separation. Scale separation is a big problem in the atmosphere. It's okay in the ocean because the, the, the turbulence is very small scale compared to the general circulation. Rossby radius is a few hundred kilometers right, or, or less. The atmosphere, Rossby radius of 1,000 kilometers, it's the same scale as the low frequency variability, pretty much. The scale separation is really on the limit of being applicable. So that's not very neat. And the atmosphere also has boundary conditions where you have mountains. So that makes things more complicated. Uh, often we want to put a rigid lid on the ocean as well. We know there isn't a lid on the ocean. So all these things get in the way of trying to apply our beautiful theories. Right? So what can we do about that? Well, what we can do is leave this planet. And here is a picture of a planet where you have beautiful scale separation and the fluid goes all the way around unimpeded. Okay? And we have these zonal jets. This is Jupiter, obviously. right? We have these zonal jets. We have these small scale eddies uh, interacting with the large scale flow. We even have this red spot, which is a beautiful example of a long lived phenomenon, which if you see this train of eddies upstream of the red spot, you can just imagine them feeding that, that long-lived low-frequency perturbation and allowing it to maintain itself against dissipation. Okay, so, here's, so that's um, Jupiter, and here's another example. Here's Saturn, and Saturn is another beautiful planet with banded cloud structures, and even has this marvelous hexagon, perfect hexagon shape on its north pole. And that can be reproduced in theory and in the laboratory. If you have a laboratory tank uh, which has perfect symmetry, you can generate repeated patterns of various different wave numbers depending on the parameters that you use, like the, the, rate, the rate at which it's spinning or the temperature gradient. So there's another example of a planet that, that's uh, susceptible to analysis. And here, here is a one of the moons of Jupiter, it's called Europa, and um, it, it's an ocean, the whole planet is an ocean planet, and not only is it an ocean planet, it actually has a rigid lid as well. It's, it's, it's covered in a thick layer of ice. So there you have an ocean that goes all the way around the planet, and, well, the moon, it's not a planet, it's a moon, it's a moon of Jupiter, and it has more water than we do on Earth. So there you are, there are some examples of how theory can be applied. And I, I just want to finish by saying that it's too easy to give a lecture course where you just grab pictures from NASA and say, look how cool fluid dynamics it is. Um, you don't need to take pictures from NASA to appreciate this. Here's a picture that I took in my back garden, and there you have it. There's Jupiter with this beautiful banded cloud structure, red spot, four moons in a row, and I think that probably that one is Europa, but I'm not completely sure.